Hello, everyone, and welcome back to an all new episode of The Financial Confessions. It's me, your host, Chelsea Fagan, founder and CEO of The Financial Diet and woman who loves to talk about money. And today I have a very unique interview. This is something I actually haven't done yet, but I'm so excited to do, especially for a topic as important as this one. I actually interviewed two separate guests today, and we're gonna be talking to one and then the other to sort of give a 360 perspective on this issue. Now, the topic for today's video is disability rights. There's gonna be some focus on specifically how it pertains to travel, but kind of covering the full spectrum of what it means to be a truly inclusive society, particularly when, as my guest point out, about one in four Americans will become disabled at some point in their lifetime, either temporarily or permanently. It's also notably one of the only identities that one can assume at a random time throughout their life, as opposed to many that we are born with. Disability rights is something we have covered on the channel before. Obviously, we had uh, one of my personal favorite interviews uh, with Imani Barbarin of Crutches and Spice, um, and we have some other guests coming up in the future who will speak to this issue as well. But as someone who does, for example, have to travel quite a bit for work uh, and who navigates many of these spaces that for an able-bodied person can already feel, quite frankly, terrible. I mean, literally, who enjoys going to the airport at this point? It is often easy to forget just how difficult so many aspects of day-to-day -day life can be for people who don't already have the luxury of being able-bodied. Now, it goes without saying, perhaps, but this is also a massive financial issue. Put simply, being disabled or being sick or in any way deviating from the norm in America costs an enormous amount of money. And again, given that this is something that can happen to people at really any time throughout their lives, and we have just recently lived through a mass disabling event with the COVID pandemic, it's all the more important for us to think not in terms of if, but when for either our ourself or someone else in our lives, because it's not just a financial issue for the person who is experiencing illness or disability, it's also a huge financial issue for the people around them. Many of us will become caretakers, many of us will deal with just the simple effects of aging, which in and of themselves can be disabling, and on top of that, are out of financial reach for many Americans. I know a lot of us are thinking about people in our lives who, for example, may not have enough saved to retire one day. The more we can think about disability in terms of something that impacts all of us in one way or another, the easier it will be to make the changes we need to make at an individual level and especially as I'm going to speak about with my second guest today at the legislative level. Because as we talk about all the time at TFC, we can do a lot individually, but some of this stuff is just going to have to come down to laws. And thanks to ZocDoc for supporting TFC. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who take your insurance and are available when you need them. Go to ZocDoc.com TFC and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top rated doctor today. And thanks to ButcherBox for supporting TFC. Sign up to get ground beef for life plus $20 off your first order at ButcherBox.com TFC and use code TFC. Without further ado, my first of two guests today is a journalist, model, and disability rights activist, Madison Lawson. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being here. So um, before we jump into it, can you just brief our audience if they may not be familiar on who you are and what you do? So my name's Maddie, like she said. I am a journalist. I've written for publications including Vogue, Allure, different um, beauty realms like that. And then um, I also do some modeling and disability rights activism is at the core of everything that I do. I'm Wheelchair Barbie on Instagram. And um, I started sharing my experiences and stories when I was about 12 years old. And um, social media is this really unique tool that I think it's really the only way that you get to kind of decide the way that people look at you and you get to kind of control that angle at which you're viewed and in society just in everyday life we don't really have the power to do that and a lot of times when you carry the label of being disabled um people kind of look at you in a way that um isn't always accurate people have a lot of assumptions there's a lot of um different things that people think that disability means that it doesn't or um, disability is just so multifaceted and it encompasses all other identities as well. So um, yeah, that's at the forefront of everything I do is just um, 
showing what disability actually looks like in my experience and um, elevating voices of other disabled activists as well. Now, to provide context, do you mind speaking a little bit about your specific disability and how it manifests just kind of in your day-to-day life? Sure. So I have a form of muscular dystrophy that causes progressive muscle weakness throughout my body. So I'm a power wheelchair user. I can't walk or weight bear at all. So I rely on my wheelchair to get around, to go everywhere. A lot of wheelchair users, um, we actually name our chairs. My wheelchair's name is Rue because she is an extension of me. She's how I exist in the world. There is no me without her. And so um, it's very important that she's functional because if I don't have her, I can't really do anything. And a lot of people, when they think of wheelchairs, they think of, um, you know, being confined or a lot of uh, a previously used term that's now outdated is wheelchair bound because for most wheelchair users, we don't feel that our wheelchairs limit us, but in fact, make our life possible. And um, so that's not a term that we like to use. We're just wheelchair users. And obviously we navigate a world differently, but um, you know, the world wasn't made with us in mind. So we just have a little work to do. Well, a lot of work to do um, in terms of making it made for us. But um, little by little, we push the needle of inclusion forward so that the world looks better for people that look like us that come after. So yeah. Now, we actually found uh, you and about the work you do uh, through a video of yours recently that went pretty viral about your experience flying. People think that us boarding first is like a perk, but truly they're just trying to hide us so the public doesn't see what's really going on. My name is Madison Lawson. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. I'm 26 years old. I'm a journalist, a model, and a disability rights activist. And I'm on my way to DC to advocate for accessible air travel. 29 wheelchairs every single day are damaged and broken by airlines and they're doing nothing to fix that. Now, we'll link the video in the description uh, on TikTok. I highly recommend everyone watch it because it is very illuminating. But um, just in this one video that you're filming, um, aside from how cumbersome and unpleasant the prospect of even boarding a plane is, your chair was damaged um and you point out in the video that i think it's 29 chairs a day are damaged in air travel um can you talk a little bit about why air travel remains so terrible frankly i mean for everyone but particularly for disabled people um and what you know can sort of where are the biggest areas of work that you're looking to 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 make changes within travel So air travel is actually the only mode of transportation left in the United States where the passenger is expected to be separated from their mobility aid, whether that's a wheelchair, whether that's a walker. Um, There's so many different mobility aids that that encompasses and wheelchairs are actually treated like luggage and are stored with the luggage and there's no protection around the chairs. Um, There's thousands upon thousands of pounds of luggage surrounding that. And um, so the likelihood of something getting damaged is very high. And um, in over a hundred years of air travel, they've not once updated the way that disabled passengers are loaded. Um, People are dropped frequently. People are injured um, from being in a chair that does not fit their body Um, because a wheelchair is so much more than just a wheelchair. These these pieces of equipment, my wheelchair in particular is about $70,000 and they carry a hefty price tag for a reason. Um, You know, having muscular dystrophy, if I'm not supported correctly, um, my chair helps me to sit up straight so I can breathe properly. Um, I, as you can see in the video, I have a hard time holding up my head if I'm not seated at the correct angle. And so, um, there's just so, a wheelchair is so much more than just a seat. Um, it's, it's quite literally a part of our bodies and how we function. And, um, the ADA hasn't historically applied to air travel. Um, there's just so much 
danger, not just for the passengers themselves, but for the people loading us for um, just the way aircrafts are designed. They're not designed for transfers. There isn't a lot of room. I mean, even non-disabled people know how tiny those seats are and how crammed everything is together. And so when you're trying to perform a transfer, which is something medically that you need to be trained to do, um, but airline staff isn't required to be medically trained to do so. Um, there's just so much room for error. There's so much room for everybody to get hurt. Um, you know, I'm a pretty small person for a grown woman and I have a hard time fitting in those little aisle chairs. Um, and I'm about the size of an average third grader. So imagine a 270 pound paralyzed man trying to get transferred on this tiny seat that, you know, it's, it's not padded, it's not safe. Um, and even air, airplane seats, they're not padded. They, people develop pressure sores all the time just from being in these seats for too long um, because those seats obviously weren't custom designed to our bodies and they're not, they're just not safe. And um, it's not even just the passenger that gets affected. It's everybody. It's um, there's also a lot of times not enough staff there to perform the transfers. And so, I mean, there's situations where flight attendants or different people have to step in and that aren't trained at all to do those kinds of things. And um, so it's just a very, very dangerous system and it needs to be not only updated, but severely modified um, to actually have some accessibility provisions in there um, just to make everybody's lifesaver. You mentioned that, you know, in the hundred years of air travel, we have not changed the way we accommodate people with disabilities on flights. It's clearly an area of massive oversight um, in terms of accessibility. But on the other hand, there have been some improvements in the way we accommodate people. Um, do you feel overall as a person um, who does have, you know, these limitations in mobility, do you feel that overall things are moving in a positive direction or do you see corners increasingly being cut and accessibility sort of being more of a buzzword than um, something that's actually being implemented? I think that accessibility is something that it's definitely better than it was a long time ago, but, you know, there have been so many people fighting and, um, you know, I can't, there's nothing I can tell you that any other disabled passenger wouldn't be able to tell you as well. Um, so it's been a lot of fighting and that needle gets pushed forward excruciatingly slow. And, um, you know, when you're waiting for it to happen, obviously, it's frustrating and um, you just want it to be equal to non-disabled people's flight experience. Um, Cause you know, we pay the same amount and um, we're just kind of hoping every time we fly that our legs are not broken when we arrive. And um, so it feels very dehumanizing and it feels very not equal. And um, so I, I definitely think that things accessibility wise, you know, overall are better, but better is not, I mean, it's not a lot better. It's, it's excruciatingly slowly getting better, but um, not, I mean, I don't think that airlines are going to make these changes without legislative representatives and people forcing that to happen because um, they've had over a hundred years and it's barely any better. So right. um, yeah, I definitely think that, um, you know, it, it could be so much better than it is and it's just going to take lawmakers forcing that to happen. It's not going to happen on its own. Um, there've been just so many so many people sharing their horror stories. And I think that's one of the hardest things is 
every single day I wake up to people messaging me or I'll read headlines about people's wheelchairs getting damaged. And it's the same story that's happened all these years. And now it's getting a little bit more momentum, I think, but um, not obviously it's frustrating to see something happen for years and years and years and it feels excruciatingly slow. Um, but I'm hopeful that change will happen and it, cause it has to. So as you mentioned in your video, one in four Americans, I think, uh, will become disabled at some point in their lifetime. Um, and as I talked about in my intro, you know, the simple act of aging, especially in such a, um, you know, in a country where it's so expensive to get older is in and of itself a huge concern. With numbers like that, that's basically guaranteed to affect you or someone close to you at some point in your life, common sense would dictate that people would take a higher interest in this or feel more personally connected to the issue. Yet it often feels like people don't feel connected to the issue and don't feel um, like these things either impact them now or will in the future. And similarly, like in, in the financial space, when we look at things like retirement, for example, you know, even amongst people who could be saving for retirement, there's often a huge gap in people doing so, in part because I think it's very difficult for people to picture themselves as being retirement age. Um, but especially after, you know, in going through the pandemic and seeing the way it has impacted people's health um, in totally sort of random and unexpected ways, you, one would assume that this would change people's perspective and make them feel more implicated by disability and healthcare activism. Have you found that to be the case or do you find people to still feel very disconnected unless they're personally impacted? I feel like there is a big disconnect. And I think that that has a lot to do with just the negative stereotypes that come along with the label of having a disability. I feel like people view disability as the worst thing that could ever happen to you. And they don't like to think about it because they they just can't fathom a life that they don't experience and they don't want to. Um, so I think that's a big reason why I know, especially the younger generation of disabled people have taken this reclaiming to the word disabled. And that's the preferred term, because the only way that you can create change is by taking something that people think that they know about and being the exact opposite of, of that while carrying that label. So you kind of redefine it in doing so. So we proudly carry the label of having a disability. And, you know, my entire life, people have always said things to me like, oh, you're so funny for a disabled person, or you're so smart for a person that's disabled or you're so pretty for a disabled person. And it's not that disabled people haven't always been all these things and more, but it's just that people don't expect that from us. So by taking back that label and saying, no, I am disabled and this is what I'm capable of doing. And, um, you know, it's, I feel like people don't want to accept that that's a possibility for them because their view of it is so inaccurate. Um, there's a lot worse things that could happen to you than becoming disabled. Um, yeah, does life has its, have its challenges? Absolutely. But I think it also gives you a different lens to look at life through. And, um, you know, it's, it's definitely not a bad one. Like I always tell people, for me, this is the only life that I've ever known. And so, I've never woken up in the morning expecting my body to do something that it doesn't. I'm not devastated every day by the fact that I cannot walk. Um, in fact, if not being able to walk was the hardest part of my day, that would be really easy to deal with. But it's actually the, those negative perceptions of what disability means in the first place that really disable me more than anything. Um, I think having to overcome those um, assumptions about what my life looks like is a lot harder than just living with it. 
It is still baffling to me the kinds of representation of disability that are not just part of the mainstream, but really celebrated and uh, kind of held up as examples. Like I can think of several, you know, examples of really popular film, uh, films, television books um, that represent disability as essentially being a life not worth living um, or as the most catastrophic thing that can happen, as you put it. And, you know, part of me wonders, you know, it, this is a very cynical thing to think, but in a culture where healthcare is so expensive and needing care is so expensive, are we intentionally creating an environment where we almost want to push that message because it's a more simple uh, narrative within this framework and within this like, you know, hyper capitalist, hyper for profit medical system that, you know, if your life is too expensive, essentially, or too cumbersome, then it isn't worth it. Um, part of me, especially when I look at the the healthcare costs associated, it's hard not to think that that may, might be part of the reasoning in America. A hundred percent. I think that if you have a disability in the United States, there is a 100% chance that at some point in your life, you have felt like a burden for that reason alone. I think um, the way that our society is run definitely kind of tells you that you're not worth anything if you're physically not able to do things. And, um, but I also think that having a disability and finding community and finding people that are like you is the best thing that you can do having a disability because um, you just learn why everything you've been kind of told by society is wrong because, you know, life is so much more than just the things that you can physically do. Um, and I think that it makes you value life differently and um, I think it makes you appreciate life in a way that not everybody even ever does or that takes years and years and years for a lot of non-disabled people to appreciate. And um, yeah, it's definitely not easy, but um, people are a lot more resilient, I think, than they're given credit for. And, um, you know, I just think that the capitalist view of of the world kind of um you know devalues people that can't function the same as everybody else and um yeah my biggest advice for disabled people is to find community and find people that are like you because it's life-changing it's life-saving and um yeah everything that everything that you've learned about you know, needing to be able to walk, to live a good life is just not true at all. Well, one of the biggest issues, I think, especially as it pertains to the cost, um, is the, in my mind, radical disconnect between, you know, a lot of people with disabilities need home health aids um, or some sort of in-home support, um, which is you know, hugely expensive on the individual, a lot of times out of reach for people, and they often will have to rely on family um, or other people in their own communities to either supplement or replace professional health aids. So it's financially out of reach on one side, and yet on the other side, it is one of the most notoriously underpaid jobs in this country, um, especially for how difficult and demanding the work can be. Um, can you speak a little bit about why you feel from your perspective this work is so devalued and so underpaid when it's such a fundamental necessity for so many americans so this is a lot to unpack um i have a lot of feelings about this so there's just problems across the board in so many aspects with this um people like me have to fight for every single minute of care we receive. And um, that is very hard. I'm somebody who personally, I can't walk. I can't transfer myself. 
I can't get in and out of my bed on my own. I can't use the restroom on my own. I can't shower by my by myself. I can't do my own hair. I can't. There's so many things that I need assistance with. And um, for me, I am fully cognitively functioning. And if I were to receive enough hours of care, I would be able to live independently. But because that's not a thing, um, I, I can't currently live on my own and um you know that's incredibly frustrating and it's hard even with the hours that you do have to keep staff um you know staying because they don't get paid enough um you know they are doing all these things helping helping us to live our lives and um If that's not, I mean, they get paid more money to work in hospitals. They get better benefits if they do that. And, and, you know, obviously you develop friendships with the people that take care of you and you want the best for them. Um, So if going to a hospital is better for them and better for their family financially, then obviously you want them to do what's best for them. But on the other hand, it's extremely frustrating because you're constantly having to, you know, open your, your most vulnerable parts of yourself up to complete strangers and retrain people. And as soon as you get, you know, as soon as you get people trained and, um, you know, you're comfortable with that person, sometimes they leave and then you have a new person and it's just, it's physically, mentally, emotionally exhausting, um, on both ends. And, um, I think that, you know, if we had better pay and better benefits that we could offer our caregivers, we would have a much better turnover. Like there would be so many people that would be able to stay because they also like doing the work. I mean, uh, if you're in home health, like that's, you know, you have to be passionate about that to to stay in it. And um, so it's it's frustrating on for both people and it's an exhausting cycle and um there just isn't enough funding going into this and you know it's it's more than just just calling them an aide or a nurse or something is it'll never be enough to describe what they actually do um you know they're my legs they're my friend they are my they, they just wear so many hats in your life. And um, I think that non-disabled people don't always have to open up and be as vulnerable with people as disabled people. And so that can be really exhausting to constantly have to, you know, reopen up and re let somebody into your life and up close to you like that. So it's, yeah, this is, I could talk about this forever, but I probably rambled on a little long. But. No, not at all. Um, and for the for uh, those listening at home, uh, we will be talking about some of the legislative next steps and action items with our next guest in this little two-parter. But a last question I kind of just wanted to, to hear your thoughts on. So you're someone who... Um, you know, you you model, you're a journalist and writer, you know, you have a level of visibility that, um, you know, is, is obviously very impressive. Um, and the work that you do is so important. Um, but I, from the outside, I, I always sort of wonder, um, when you're in these jobs, whether it is modeling, you know, writing, whatever it might be, to what extent do you feel that a the inclusivity is sincere and longer term and something that goes beyond just you know a token appearance here or there and kind of beyond that to what extent do you feel um expected to always sort of speak about and from the perspective of um, the issue of disability as opposed to just being able to speak about, you know, whatever issue you might want to or just talk about fun things. Um, because I do personally, as, as someone who's been in media for 12 years and, and has seen a lot of various cycles in this conversation about representation, sometimes it can feel very heartening, but oftentimes it can feel a bit limiting or tokenizing. 
When I was a kid, I never saw people that looked like me in media. The only time I ever saw people portrayed with disabilities in media in any way was to either promote inspiration porn, which inspiration porn is essentially taking a person with a disability and using their life experience to make yourself feel better as a non-disabled person. And um, that's, you've probably seen this in things like posters where um, I can particularly remember one example of when I was in high school, there was a poster on one of my teacher's walls and it had a child with a limb difference who didn't have arms that had a pencil in their mouth and they were writing their name and it said, what's your excuse? <laughs> and um, I always sorry. remembered feeling icky about it and not liking it. And I couldn't quite understand why I didn't like it because they were trying to be nice, but it doesn't feel nice on the receiving end to be kind of put on this pedestal of, well, at least my life doesn't look like yours. So what's my excuse? Um, so yeah, it's either to portray that or to invoke a sense of pity. And neither of those things are flattering. Neither of those things are ways that are accurate or that are ways anybody would really want to be thought about. And um, so, you know, I feel very privileged to be in the time that we live in. And, um, you know, I, I know that as a young disabled person still, I'm very privileged to get to see models that look like me on the runways at uh, Fashion Week. And, um, you know, finally media is letting us um, be a part of the narrative in a way that's positive and in a way that's more accurate and authentic. And um, that's, you know, part of that is finally having actual disabled people portraying disabled roles, which is really important um, to have an authentic view of what that life looks like. But um, I remember in the very beginning of my modeling career, um, I was so afraid on set to kind of call out things when they wouldn't be accessible because I didn't want to be labeled as you know, hard to work with, or when it was things that were provided for the non-disabled models and things like people forgetting that, you know, we need accessible transportation or we need, you know, just little things that you don't think about when you're not disabled. And it's not that, it wasn't that I was angry at them. It was just that I was frustrated that, you know, when I speak out about stuff now, I definitely think about my community as a whole. And um, we deserve those same things that is provided to every every non-disabled model. And so it makes it a little easier to speak up. It makes it a little easier to, you know, call out things when they are happening that aren't right. Because, you know, in the beginning it was super intimidating because there just wasn't really many models at all. I could count on one hand how many models were working in the industry when I first started. Well, now I'm seeing it a lot more and that's, you know, I feel so lucky to be in this generation where that is finally happening. Um, And yeah, I think just now when I work with brands, one of the first things I ask before I accept a job is, okay, so what is your brand doing to be inclusive of people with disabilities or how are you making your products you know, better advertised for people that have disabilities. And, um, you know, so I I think holding companies accountable to their word and, um, okay, if you want to be inclusive, how are you doing that? And making sure that there's an answer and that there's a tangible answer. And um, also, you know, if they have an event for that, making sure that those events are accessible because I could tell you, and there's countless other disabled models that I could tell you, you know, we've been in situations where we show up and there's stairs to get to whatever event they invited us to and no elevator. And um, so it's just little things like that that I think aren't intentionally done to be um, exclusive, but that brands just need to be accountable for and to, um, you know, just really think about if they want to use disabled models they need to make things truly inclusive and accessible 
And um, yeah, I don't, I, we don't want to just be a photo. We don't want to just be a moment. We want to be included. And inclusion is way more than a snapshot. Inclusion is more than a moment. It's, you know, it's seeing actual inclusion of um, our, our community as a whole and seeing brands making adaptable products or making products that, you know, we're not an afterthought. We want to be thought about in the beginning, just like everybody else. Well, thank you so much, uh, Maddie, for giving me your time um, and for all of the really amazing work you do. For the second part of this episode, I'm going to be speaking to attorney Paul Melmeyer, who works on the advocacy on all of these issues, specifically as it pertains to legislation, because as Maddie pointed out, uh, a lot of this is not going to change just out of the goodness of giant corporations' hearts. We're going to require uh, turning the screws on them a bit uh, in terms of policy. So thank you again, Maddie, and we will uh, be right back with Paul. I want to take a quick pause and thank today's sponsor, ZocDoc. If there's one thing you should actually take the time to do, it's find yourself a good doctor, whether it's for your mental health, your yearly checkup, or a new dentist because you're still going to the same one from your childhood and realize you don't actually like them. Finding the right doctor should not be an overwhelming task. It should actually be the opposite. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient reviewed, take your insurance, are available when you need them, and treat almost every condition under the sun. Instead of going to TikTok for medical advice, no shade because you know I love TikTok, it's just not where I nor you should be seeking out medical advice, I use ZocDoc, literally, I personally do use it, to find the right medical professionals, and you should too. Like I said, I actually use ZocDoc and honestly, it has been really, really helpful to just keep that entire part of my life totally organized as it's something that can easily feel overwhelming and become an item on your to-do list that just kind of lingers there forever and gives you anxiety. ZocDoc is honestly the GOAT. And if for whatever reason you're not feeling your best, finding the right care shouldn't take up all your time and energy. That's where ZocDoc comes in to help. Using their free app that millions of users rely on, you can find the right doctor that meets your needs and fits your busy schedule. Here in New York City, some doctors are booked up for weeks, if not months in advance, and that's not particularly helpful when you have something that needs timely attention. With ZocDoc, you can book an appointment with a few taps in their app and choose from thousands of patient-reviewed doctors and specialists, browse doctor profiles, upload and verify your insurance information, and get the care you need in one place. Go to ZocDoc.com TFC and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then book a top-rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash TFC. ZocDoc.com slash TFC. All right, let's talk about it, guys. I'm ready to have that conversation because your girl is in her butcher box era. Now, not so long ago, I received my first butcher box. So as many of you might know, if you follow me on social media, I am pretty into cooking at home. I'm into hosting, entertaining, things like that. Um, I pretty much stay in my kitchen. Uh, and uh, I do try to be conscientious about where I source my products. I've talked about this before on the channel. Like I like to use, you know, more farmers markets, more local products, more seasonal produce, like all that good stuff. Um, but honestly, like it can be hard to shop for it on a regular basis. And like, it's just another thing I have to add to my to-do list. And it's like, I love the farmer's market, but I'm not out there buying a roll of paper towels there. So it just adds another stop. And I do still go there quite a bit, but when we started talking to ButcherBox about doing ads, I was really, really interested because it's actually a product that I have been interested in for a while, um, just in terms of like having really high quality um, meat products that I can feel good about and not have to constantly be thinking about where I'm gonna source them and to be able to meal plan more effectively. Um, anyway, suffice to say, like a week ago or a couple weeks ago, my butcher box arrives and I had like selected what I wanted for it. So it was like all the things that I knew I wanted to cook with. My husband was like, what is this? Like truly it was like Christmas morning. Now, as you will see in the uh, video here, if you're watching, um, it was a comical amount of meat for a New York City girl. Like I'm gonna be working my way through this for a bit now. Um, but it does have a nice little home in my freezer now. Um, but I have been absolutely loving it. I've already made several meals, like you can see here. Um, and I have a few really big ones planned. Like I got, one of the things that I got was like um, really nice little steaks. And so I'm gonna do a beautiful steak dinner for when my husband comes home for work travel in a couple days. Anyway, um, obviously ButcherBox is paying us uh, because we're advertising for them, but I can honestly say I'm just gonna keep using ButcherBox uh, even if they stop giving us ad money because I'm really enjoying it and um, it's really tasty. 
it's really, it's like honestly a great product. I fully endorse it. I'm in my ButcherBox era and I'm here to stay. And beyond my personal experience, it's worth saying that ButcherBox makes it easy to find high quality meat and seafood that you can trust. They have incredible deals and everything from ButcherBox is humanely raised with no antibiotics or added hormones. They offer curated and customized boxes like the one I got, exclusive member deals, recipes, tips, and shipping is always free. And ButcherBox is giving us a special deal. Sign up today using code TFC to receive ground beef for life, plus $20 off your first order. That's two pounds of ground beef free in every box for the lifetime of your membership, plus $20 off your first order when you sign up at butcherbox.com TFC and use code TFC. So as promised, guys, we kind of wanted to get a 360 perspective on this issue that we spoke about with Maddie and obviously her personal experience. And something that we address quite a bit on this channel is the need for policy changes if we are going to make meaningful impacts in almost any area that we talk about on the financial confessions. Now, obviously there will never be a reason to not make individual changes in your own life and to do what you can on the individual level to be a solution to some of these issues, both in terms of accessibility and all of the other issues that we speak of. But not only is there a limitation to what we can all do individually, especially if we have more limited financial resources, the constant focus on individual action can often be a bit of a distraction or a letting off the hook of the policy changes that need to happen. Legislation is not particularly sexy and can also feel sometimes very overwhelming to think about, but as someone who does amongst other things, quite a bit of th quite a bit of phone banking and canvassing for various issues. I can say that particularly on the more local levels, like these things make a massive difference. And specifically as it pertains to things like air travel, like we talked about with Maddie, companies like gigantic airlines are not just going to make changes out of the goodness of their heart. Their hands are going to need to be forced. And ultimately, as we've seen with air travel, again, as an example, even aside from the disability issues. When profit is the center of gravity and the focus of all of these corporate efforts, everything else is going to suffer. Now that ranges from just the average consumer experience, because let's be clear, flying is extremely shitty for everyone, right down to making it damn near impossible for people like Maddie to get on a plane. So we've heard a little bit about the individual experience, but I wanted to speak as well with someone who specializes in the policy advocacy and legislative changes that are going to be necessary to actually change some of this stuff, both on a global scale and also permanently because it's very easy to throw a token level of accessibility here or there, but long-term changes are going to necessitate legislation. So without further ado, I want to welcome my guest, public policy advocate, Paul Melmeyer. Hi, Paul. Hi there. Hi. Um, okay. So first and foremost, uh, tell our audience what a public policy advocate is. Absolutely. Well, first, Chelsea, thank you so much for having me on the podcast today. Very excited uh, to be joining you. Uh, so within my role, we partner with the neuromuscular disease patient community and really listening to them and what the everyday challenges of their life may be. And if there happen to be uh, public policy changes that we can pursue within the Muscular Dystrophy Association's Public Policy and Advocacy Department, we hope to do so to try to improve and benefit those who we serve. Now, when you're, uh, you know, working on policy advocacy, what does that entail practically? Does, I mean, are you more interfacing with, you know, constituencies? Are you directly working with, you know, legislators? Like what are, what are your sort of day-to-day -day areas of focus? Absolutely. So we channel the energy, the stories, the efforts of our community into public policy action on Capitol Hill in front of congressional lawmakers, as well as those in regulatory agencies or within uh, the administration. As these individuals, these policymakers on Capitol Hill or in the regulatory agencies, they're making decisions every single day that impact the lives of those who we serve. So as they're making those decisions, we want to ensure that our community's voice is heard and heard well in those uh, conference rooms in which uh, these uh, heavy duty policy making decisions are occurring in our elected law, uh, officials as well as uh, those in the administration. So something that we run into quite a bit on the show, and as I talked a little bit about in, in my intro to our conversation, is the 
immense focus that is placed on individual choice and individual action. Um, and I mean, just like basically every aspect of consumer life, right? Like we talk all the time, like, for example, when it comes to environmental causes, we are sort of taught implicitly or explicitly to focus on the individual choices that we're making, um, you know, but as it pertains to things like, you know, accessibility, inclusivity, all of that, we're often really speaking in terms of either, you know, our individual practices or really isolated acts of inclusion, which can, I mean, for many, in many cases, boil down to tokenism, especially if, you know, the company involved isn't actually making any meaningful changes. Um, can you talk a little bit about why in America we have such an aversion to thinking in terms of legislation and public policy and such a focus on individual cases? It's a really fantastic question, Chelsea. I think uh, there is this uh, attitude, this longstanding and well-baked in um, viewpoint that has been uh, really kind of emphasized from everyone's childhood about our own personal responsibility, uh, primarily to our own well-being and ourselves, but also even to those around us. It's kind of part of the fabric of our country, if you will. Uh, getting back to the whole pull yourself up by your own bootstraps idea. And so consequently, if one may be challenged with one's health, with one's finances, with one's mobility even, uh, the way in which our society oftentimes is set up makes it seem as if that's our own fault, that's our own responsibility, rather than it's a systemic failure that is contributing uh, to the issue at hand. And the case in which we're discussing today with air travel there is no better example of this in which individuals with mobility disabilities who are uh, unable oftentimes to travel by air because of the true inaccessibility of doing so, that oftentimes it's made uh, airlines and others make it feel as if it's the individual's fault for having the disability, for not being able to safely uh, transfer from their wheelchair into an aisle chair and onto the plane, for not having told the airline that their wheelchair could be damaged in these ways. So it's a common thread that is woven throughout our entire society for that matter, but is very prominent within the topic we're specifically focusing on today. What's interesting about the air travel example in particular is that obviously air travel has gotten, I mean, absolutely terrible for everyone who flies. Um, and so many of the changes that would make you know, a huge difference in terms of accessibility, like a really obvious one being making aisles wider and having more room in seats um, would also benefit everyone. Um, and I'm kind of curious as to how focusing on those sort of universal benefits plays into advocacy in terms of making everyone more motivated to, to take on these issues. Well, absolutely. And, and there are a few things to consider when we're talking about those with disabilities having accessible air travel. For one, the disabled population is actually the largest minority in the United States. One in four individuals have a disability. And it's the only population, it's the only minority that really any individual can join at any time uh, through uh, any, any means, uh, unfortunate means often. But uh, because of that, um, any individual who may be able-bodied today could be disabled tomorrow or next month or next year or down the road for that matter. And so everybody has a stake in advoc advocating for accessibility uh, for those with disabilities. Furthermore, if we actually make air travel more accessible for those with disabilities, we're gonna be benefiting everybody because now individuals with disabilities who choose not to fly or not fly as often as they could, uh, they will be able to uh, better travel and see friends or participate in a new job or uh, go to that travel spot that is trying to attract tourists, but because of the inaccessibility of air travel, uh, a vast majority of individuals with mobility disabilities can't travel to that location. So oftentimes when we think about issues such as this one in which it's those with mobility disabilities that are affected the very most, and those who are able-bodied might not necessarily think about it very much because why would it affect me? Well, it actually affects everybody in, in many, many different ways. The ways that you mentioned in particular about uh, the physical changes to uh, aircrafts and to the experience of flying would also benefit those who are able-bodied because aircrafts would be more comfortable, bathrooms would be larger because they would be accessible, no longer would we be shoved into that tiny closet. Uh, customer service would be better 
because the uh, customer service agents who are dealing with us, whether they're on the phone or actually at the airport uh, or are working with us to, uh, with their bag, uh, baggage or whatever it happens to be, they'll be better trained as a result of reforms being made uh, with, with uh, the advocacy of, of uh, those with disabilities. So um, there are benefits, many benefits, the entirety of society if air travel was made more accessible for those with disabilities. When I think about a lot of the issues that are making, you know, day-to-day life so terrible for basically everyone, um, especially in terms of both on the side of the consumer, consumer experience, air travel being a great example, but also in terms of the worker, in terms of compensation, um, on all sides of the issue, for the average person, it can feel like quality of experience, quality of compensation, all of these things are really rapidly decreasing. And from my perspective, it seems clear that a huge part of the problem, um, if not the largest problem, is the shareholder profit sort of imperative that companies have, right? Like they have to maximize shareholder profit. That's how they judge success. That's, you know, usually their most important metric. Um, and everything else sort of inherently has to take a backseat to that, whether it's cutting corners on the actual product, on manufacturing, on environmental practices, on employee compensation and benefits, like everything feels very downstream from that. And accessibility is obviously one of the, you know, quickest areas to cut from, you know, that perspective. To what extent do you feel like the profit motivator is central to all of these problems? And is that an area of focus for your advocacy? It certainly is. We see the viewpoints from the airline industry that prioritize the profit of their business over the civil rights of those with disabilities as really being at the very core of this issue. Uh, We hear time and time again from the airline industry, primarily from their trade representatives, but also at times from individual airlines, that is too expensive to make air travel more accessible for those with disabilities, or perhaps that it's too expensive to implement a new rule that would help those with disabilities take, for example, a new rule published this summer that would actually make lavatories on single aisle airplanes accessible. The airline industry would say, we need upwards of 30 years to actually implement those on our airplanes. Otherwise it's gonna be too expensive to do so. Uh, And that it's not gonna actually eat into the profit of the airlines, what they will say is that the cost will be borne by the consumer. Ticket prices are going to go up for everybody, or flights are actually going to be cut down because they can't afford to have as many flights in that way. Now, that that argument that we hear from the airline industry just doesn't make much sense to us. And there are two reasons for that. For one, there actually have been economic analyses that have shown that if you take maybe a couple rows out of an airplane in order to actually add an accessible lavatory to that plane, the average ticket price would go up about $2.50 to $3 perhaps within uh, the timeline of implementation. And that analysis was actually done by the Department of Transportation. So obviously an unbiased entity doing that analysis. And I think $2.50 or $3 more per ticket is worth the cost of having individuals with disabilities being able to use the bathroom on a flight and not having to dehydrate themselves or risk soiling themselves for that matter if uh, they choose to fly. In addition to that, even if the cost was higher than that, uh, we know that individuals with disabilities would fly much more frequently. And so business would go way up. Business would go way up for the airlines and you'd have a lot, um, uh, many additional customers actually hoping to fly, uh, seeking to fly that currently are choosing not to fly commercially whatsoever. But I think something that's important to emphasize is when we make these kind of dollars and cents arguments for accessible air travel, Frankly, that's kind of missing the point. We shouldn't be putting dollar figures around the civil rights, the inherent rights of individuals with disabilities of enjoying the very same privileges that individuals who are able-bodied are able to enjoy. So while we, while we have very strong financial arguments for why air travel should be made accessible, let's not lose the fact that we shouldn't need financial arguments to justify the civil rights of those with disabilities. With air travel in particular, so... I don't know if this is even, I mean, it's probably obvious to you, but not necessarily obvious to everyone. You know, 
air travel is a huge battleground for environmental practices, right? It's, you know, uh, it's something I think about quite a bit as someone who does travel uh, a fair amount uh, by plane. And it's something that, you know, we have really depressed the cost of flying um, in America in particular, um, because we, amongst other things, have almost not at all invested in our national rail travel and have, by developed world standards, you know, the most horrendous possible uh, train travel um, for as advanced as we are in other areas. We are clearly subsidizing this industry at the expense of, you know, not just the environmental impacts, but also the functionality, right? Like anyone who's been to Western Europe um, or, I mean, huge swaths of Asia and even South America, for that matter, knows that train travel rocks and should be um, should be a lot more a part of the the fabric of uh, American life. Can you talk a little bit about some of the accessibility um, advances that have been made in other forms of transportation and to what extent um, prioritizing transportation like uh, more comprehensive tr train travel is a part of overall advocacy for accessibility. Absolutely. So other forms of mass travel in the United States, the accessibility of those forms of travel are governed by the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so consequently, it's no surprise that traveling by train, traveling by bus, traveling by subway, that these are all much more accessible than traveling by air. Uh, and it's because the Americans with Disabilities Act, after, after having been passed in the early 1990s, has been updated many times, uh, both in its interpretation by the administration, through judicial rulings, even through some uh, legislative updates for that matter. And so consequently, these are much more accessible modes of travel, and those with disabilities oftentimes prefer them. We know individuals who have attended events with the Muscular Dystrophy Association have traveled by train all the way from Florida to Washington, D.C., and that's obviously a very long trip. And not only is that a long trip just because it's a far distance, but also because of the system that we have of train travel. There are stops. It takes a while to get there. Trains don't travel nearly as quickly, as course, of course, as trains uh, in Western Europe or in Asia or, or elsewhere, as you mentioned. And so consequently, uh, because of that, individuals with disabilities, whereas they might prefer the more accessible uh, travel mechanisms, oftentimes uh, it takes them several days to get somewhere, whereas if they were able to fly, it could only take them a few hours. So con th this is an economic tax on the disability community. And one way around getting this economic tax, of course, primarily would be to make air travel more accessible. But we can also make rail travel, bus travel, other forms of travel much more uh, frequent, much uh, less expensive, and also more accessible even uh, for those with disabilities so that for those who do still choose to travel by train, by bus or otherwise, uh, that they can do so in a quicker, more affordable manner, thus opening up possibilities for them even greater. Is the airline's ability to skirt the Americans with Disability Act, is that just like a lobbying victory for them? Like, how are they able to get around it while other forms of transportation are not? So the airline industry is actually carved out of the of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The airline industry is actually regulated by something called the Air Carrier Access Act of 1986. This was actually an accessibility law that was uh, passed and signed into law prior to the ADA even existing. And so consequently, four years after the Air Carrier Access Act was passed and signed into law in 1986, as the Americans with Disabilities Act was being uh, debated and then eventually signed into law, they carved out the airline industry from that bill, thinking that that was already covered. That was already covered well enough over in the Air Care Access Act. We don't need to layer on additional regulations or additional requirements onto the airline industry because of that. Now, unfortunately, what's happened since then is whereas the Americans with Disabilities Act has been improved many times in the ensuing 30 years, strengthened, expanded, and really has solidified in many places accessibility for those with disabilities, the Air Care Access Act has essentially languished. It has not been updated whatsoever in the ensuing 35 plus years uh, since its passage and signing into law. Now, there are some small regulatory changes here or there, but Muscular Dystrophy Association has been trying to update this law uh, for uh, about a decade at this point with many other advocates in the disability community. And each time we go to Congress and say, we need to update the Air Care Access Act, and the bill is called the Air Care Access Amendments Act, 
the airline industry also goes up to Congress and says, it's too expensive. We can't do it in that time frame. Uh, we don't want to support this. And unfortunately, Congress does not necessarily listen to us. They oftentimes are more willing to listen to the airline industry. And that's why we haven't been able to update that law for over 35 years now. That's awful. <laughs> it often feels like the air, the airline industry in particular is just like an unstoppable beast of bad practice and destructive, uh, you know, uh, systems. And, you know, even looking at, for example, during, you know, the, the height of the pandemic when air travel, you know, was basically grinding to a halt, um, you know, the, the tens of thousands, if not maybe hundreds of thousands of flights that were going on empty every day just to maintain these slots and, you know, I, I suppose maintain some sort of accord um, with, you know, airports and things like that. Um, so even what could have been, you know, a silver lining in terms of the environmental benefit of slowing this travel, you know, even that doesn't... Um, you know, it, it 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 just often feels as though air travel in particular exists in such a different dimension from what we're able to impact. How do you advise people think about this particular beast without getting overwhelmed or feeling defeated, given how powerful it seems? Yeah, it's it's easy to get disconcerted when looking at the success the airline industry has had in preventing their practices from becoming more accessible over the course of the last uh, 35 years and even longer than that for that matter. The good news though, is that we have people like Maddie, we have many other disability advocates who are uh, really raising their voices, really loudly emphasizing how important it is for those with disabilities to actually be able to travel by air in, a, in, in an accessible and safe manner. And we're having a positive effect. I think this year we have the possibility of actually breaking through some of the log jam that the airline industry has been able to create up on Capitol Hill. And this is through this year's Federal Aviation Act, FAA reauthorization, in which we've successfully gotten many provisions that actually make air travel a lot more safe and a lot more successful or a lot more accessible, I should say, into uh, the, the 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 bill. In fact, uh, in the House of Representatives, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, uh, with uh, almost 400 individuals voting in favor of the bill, we have accessibility provisions within that legislation that would make air travel much more accessible than it ever was before. And for those who are wheelchair users, actually create the path for individuals who are wheelchair users to be able to bring their wheelchair onto the plane. So this is a good example of where it may seem impossible, where it may seem as if the airline industry and those aligned with it are so well entrenched on Capitol Hill that no change is ever really going to happen. Actually, it can. If you have the right voices, you have the right number of folks going up there, talking with their legislators, talking with uh, the staff of legislators, talking with the administration, uh, participating in initiatives at the Muscular Dystrophy Association and many other fantastic advocacy organizations are leading right now to get these voices up to Capitol Hill, folks can really make a difference. And I think we're seeing that this year, and we're very hopeful that the final FAA reauthorization that will eventually pass Congress, uh, we're hopeful that it will include all of these accessibility provisions that we're very excited about. Well, one of the other issues that um, Maddie and I talked about in our conversation was the access of, um, I mean, just frankly, day-to-day -day help um, for people with disabilities, specifically in the form of home health aids and how prohibitively expensive it can be on the, um, you know, individual or the family that needs the health aid, but then how criminally underpaid, um, you know, the job is for the people who actually do it. Um, and having AIDS like this, having care isn't just obviously a consideration in the home. It's also, you know, for many individuals, like something that would be extremely important to have while traveling and, you know, while essentially engaging in, in any um, activity that takes longer than, you know, uh, an hour or so. Um, to what extent is, you know, your policy work focused on, you um, the, the human resources that 
individuals with disabilities have and where are you seeing progress being made in that area specifically given how essential a part it is of you know just the most baseline level of accessibility absolutely well home and community-based services or hcbs are one of the most important uh services that our community relies on as well as looks to mda to fight for access to and that's because many individuals with mobility disabilities or other neuromuscular conditions for that matter, rely on home health care uh, assistance, aids or, or other uh, assistance for that matter, uh, to uh, do activities of daily living or to uh, be able to travel or go to work or whatever it happens to be. But to your point, these services are critically underfunded and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, for one, there's no program within our patchwork health care system um, that actually guarantees access to home health care aids. Some private insurers, of course, will cover a home health care uh, worker uh, assisting an individual with disability. Medicaid has uh, an allowance for home health care workers to assist those with Medicaid, and same goes for uh, the Medicare program at times. Um, but the issue is that uh, the funding for these individuals, and the, so the funding is, is, is incredibly inadequate. Um, there are very few dollars going to state Medicaid programs to actually allow them to uh, offer these services to individuals with disabilities. And so consequently, we see waiting lists of over 100,000 people in any single state for that matter, uh, waiting for access to home and community-based services. And then to the point that you also made, individuals who are actually home and community-based services workers are critically underpaid. The value of their skill sets, the value of the services that they provide are greatly undervalued within our society, unfortunately. And so consequently, uh, it's a very difficult job to actually keep or to, to pursue as a career because it's so underfunded compared to other career options. The individuals who are home health care workers oftentimes burn out or just financially, it's not going to make sense for them to continue to do so. So that's the bad news. And the, the continuing bad news is that we were very close last year to getting billions of dollars of funding for home and community-based services through Congress as part of the initiative that eventually resulted in the Inflation Reduction Act. Another, of course, incredibly important law that is contributing in many ways to other benefits in society uh, to this day. But something that we are hoping would have been included in that law, which was the billions, hundreds of billions of dollars that would have gone to strengthening our home and community-based services uh, system, unfortunately did not make the final bill. So instead, we continue to work with Congress, we continue to work with the administration, and there is some credit due to the administration. They have tried their very best to make home and community-based services uh, more widely available to those who require them. Uh, but because there's still so little coverage, there's still so little money going into these systems because there's still, still so inadequate pay going to those who are home health care workers, there's an incredible shortage uh, and oftentimes inability to obtaining home health care services for those with disabilities. So as a last question, so something I really recommend um, for a lot of people who are looking to get involved politically in some capacity, but feel very overwhelmed and, un, you know, and frankly, sometimes uh, nihilist, um, I often will recommend that people have some level of involvement on the more local levels of government just because a it's you know a lot more tangible there you can often see results a lot more quickly you know something that i point to a lot here in new york city is you know when i moved to new york city 10 years ago there were essentially no protected bike lanes now every day i can commute on entirely protected bike lanes um which is a huge victory across, you know, so many different aspects of advocacy. Um, but point being, especially, and, and there is obviously huge importance at the national level as well, but for the individual who's looking to, um, to not just make a difference, but to see the difference in more real time, um, a local a project can be a great place to start. Are there aspects of disability advocacy that you recommend people look into on their more community-based level or local levels of government? Yes, absolutely. Uh, local jurisdictions actually have a very important role to play when it comes to accessible living. And the way that I say accessible living is because it's local jurisdictions that are going to make the decisions about an accessible park or curb cuts or just other ways in which 
a potentially inaccessible place could be made accessible. That's actually oftentimes up to the local jurisdiction to make it happen, to fund that project, to prioritize that project, to make sure those with disabilities have the very same access to a business or to a service or to a building um, that individuals uh, without disabilities, those who are able-bodied have. In addition to that, there's a gross shortage of accessible housing, housing for individuals with disabilities in which uh, the showers are constructed uh, to be a roll-in shower or for the light switches to be low enough on the walls for individuals who are wheelchair users to be able to reach the light switch or for cabinets to be low enough and to have cupboards that are available for those uh, who are wheelchair users to be able to use. But these kinds of mandates, these kinds of uh, requirements for builders are by and large actually at the local level. These are local jurisdictions, perhaps the municipality or the city, uh, or sometimes the state, but oftentimes it's the township for that matter, that is actually making the requirement of that new building that's going to go up actually has to have 10% accessible units. Um, so there are incredible opportunities for those who are looking to get more involved at the local level uh, to actually uh, serve those with disabilities, join those with disabilities in, in these advocacy priorities. We love it. Um, well, thank you so, so much for your time. Um, I so appreciate it. Where can people go who are looking to join forces with you specifically um, do so? Yeah, well, I appreciate that opportunity. We, we would love to have folks join us at the Muscular Dystrophy Association. The way to do so is to go to nda.org backslash advocacy. And if you're looking to get involved uh, more specifically within our accessible air travel efforts, you can go to nda.org backslash uh, accessible air travel, where you can go straight to a link to send a letter to your congressperson to ask them to ensure any FAA reauthorization that passes this year has all of these accessible accessibility provisions that Maddie, that myself, hundreds of thousands of other advocates are advocating for. If there's one thing we stand here at TFD, it's yelling at your congressperson, make them work for their salaries, um, especially those terrible ones who have been there forever and are just riding on counting on people not voting or getting involved and you know who you are congress people time to get you out of office but in the meantime the least we can do is uh harass them about issues that are important thank you again so much paul and thank you all at home for tuning in and i will see you next monday on an all-new episode of the financial confessions goodbye <laughs>